Good afternoon, I'm David Snyder, President and CEO of the Economic Club of Chicago. And I'm honored to welcome today's featured speaker, Tracy Ellis Ross, actor, CEO, and producer. I'm also pleased to be joined by Mary Dillon, CEO of Alta Beauty and the club's incoming chair who will moderate today's discussion. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Mary Dillon. Named one of Fortune Magazine's most powerful women, Mary, a lifelong Chicagoan, has over 35 years of experience leading consumer-driven brands across a diverse range of industries. In her eight years as CEO of Alta Beauty, Mary developed and nurtured the company's winning inclusive culture and drove significant business growth. Over that time, Alta's market capitalization more than tripled to over $18 billion. Mary serves on the board of directors of Starbucks and KKR and is chairperson of the Retail Industry Leaders Association. She's also an executive committee member at the Business Council and a board member at Save the Children. Mary, thanks for moderating today's discussion. I turn things over to you. I'm so thrilled to be here today and to introduce our speaker for today, Tracy Ellis Ross. Listen, Renaissance Woman is not a title that I use for very many people, if anybody, but it certainly feels to me it's exactly the right phrase to use to describe today's speaker, the actor, producer, activist, and CEO, Tracy Ellis Ross. Now, Tracy is perhaps most recognizable uh, for her roles in television shows like Blackish and Girlfriends. She's also been working extensively behind the scenes at her production company, Joy Mill Entertainment, which is committed to amplify multi-layered stories that reframe assumptions about how people see themselves and see each other. The authenticity that Tracy brings to her role as actor and producer is at the core of the company that she currently leads, which was founded in 2019, Pattern Beauty. Now, despite the fact that hair care is a huge industry, in the US it's $10 billion in sales if you look at the total industry, Tracy looked at that and saw that there was a lack of true innovation, innovation around products for her own hair type. And she was inspired to create the natural hair care line pattern that targets people with curly, coily, and textured hair, regardless of gender or ethnicity. Now through that lens, Tracy is challenging companies and calling on leaders of all industries to move the needle on diversity and inclusion. And I can personally relay how grateful we have been at Ulta Beauty for Tracy's guidance as our diversity and inclusion advisor. And we deeply appreciate the, her work to ensure that people of color can see their beauty reflected in the world around them. Well, thank you so much for being here today. On behalf of the entire Economic Club of Chicago, we're thrilled, we're honored. It's really a privilege to have you here. Uh, so I'd love to just dive into many aspects of things that we want to learn about you. And I'll kind of take it in some chunks of the journey along the way, if yeah. that's okay. And then of course yeah. we have the uh, audience today. I, yeah. I also just want to say thank you so much for having me. This is a very exciting thing for me as I um, start being out in the world as a CEO and having these kinds of conversations. And Mary, you've been such a big part of that journey for me. Um, and so I really appreciate this conversation being with you. And thank you, David, for having me. Um, I wish we were in person so we could sit and feel the room, um, yeah. but we'll have to do this virtually. And thank you. So let's dive in. What you got? Let's dive in. Yeah, I got a lot. Um, I'd like to start with your career journey. There's a lot I want to ask about the CEO portion. That's how I know you very best, right? Which is great. But I'd love to hear about your journey as I think you're a model when you're younger, an actress, a producer. I mean, you've done it all. And maybe just kind of high level sort of that journey. And then I'd love to dive in and talk about Blackish, which you know I'm such a huge fan of and the impact that it's yeah. had. But let's talk about your journey overall. Okay, well, um, I'm like, when I was born, no. Um, mm. It started um, the, I was a really shy young girl, which is hard for people to imagine, but totally true. And I had a big personality that, um, came out with a lot of humor and a lot of joy, and I loved making people laugh. I also have always loved beautiful clothes and um, and that whole aspect of life, being my mom's child. It was uh, something I grew up with, seeing a woman in a sparkly dress, having her own agency. And so my love of fashion and style led me to the modeling. Um, and that started in high school. And I didn't get very far as a model, but I did do some modeling. And my mom actually says, 
that when I was modeling, it was when she first started to see me come out of my shell. But what I discovered in the modeling was that I loved a captive audience. So often I would be, you know, supposed to be taking beautiful pictures and I was busy, busy telling stories and making people laugh and, and sort of getting them um, to hear my voice and point of view. Um, and then that translated, I went to Brown University and I was a theater concentrator. We say concentration and not major there. So I um, studied theater at Brown and started doing some acting um, and translated that being in front of people version of me into the acting world um, and discovered that all of the things that I um, sort of I don't know, was uncomfortable with about myself, whatever those things are, I was able to use and channel into a sense of freedom with these characters, which was really fun for me. And then I left college and I had a choice when I left college and I started working in the fashion industry, which I don't think a lot of people know. So I was a fashion editor and stylist. I worked New York Magazine, Mil uh, Mirabella Magazine. Um, and then when I graduated from college, I took the leap into the acting and I haven't stopped acting since. Um, and now I just style myself, <laughs> style other people. Um, and the acting um, really gave me access to a world that let me know that our stories weren't our, always told. Um, and I also wasn't always seeing myself reflected back to me or my community. And that is what has given birth to the producing. Um, but pattern and the hair care and the beauty industry and me being a CEO fits somewhere right in there. And it's been a very, a very kind of specific path, honestly, that has led me here. And I have the same mission in all areas of my career in life. Right, which is so cool. You know, sometimes people ask me, did you ever dream about being a CEO? When I think I dreamt maybe I could be an actress. Did you ever dream about being a CEO when, or did you do, when you were an actress? You know what's funny, Mary? I didn't even know what a CEO was. CEO was. I come from a family of artists, um, so no one was in the corporate world. I really didn't know what a CEO, a CEO was. I didn't. When someone said C-suite, I was like, I don't know what that is. That something at like a like um, when you go to a sports game? Game is that where like people? Is that like the VIP seats? Yeah, I didn't really. I didn't know what that was. Um, but boy, have I learned, and it's been a really extraordinary journey for me that I am loving. Um, I love using yes. my mind. Um, I'm, it, it's one of my favorite things. <laughs> and so this journey with pattern and learning how to be a CEO and what that actually means has been a really fruitful and exciting journey for right. me. Well, so much to unpack there. And I just admire you're clearly uh, always on a lifelong journey of learning and pushing yourself. I love when you said you like a captive audience. I, that's good to know about oneself, right? I mean, there's a lot to be said for that. And I did not know that you were in the fashion industry, but that makes all the sense in the world now. So I need to come for some styling. Okay. But I want to stay on Blackish for a minute. So I'm sure many people that are listening today have seen you on that fabulous show and others. Um, but I just feel, well, first of all, it's you're filming, maybe completing your eighth season right now. I'm not sure we if you're just filming. Finished our, we finished our seventh season and we're walking seventh into season. our eighth and final season. Yes, okay, but that's a huge run. I know you've won Golden Globe for Best Actress. I also learned, this is super cool, that the show has been in the top 10 in terms of audience size for US television shows, I think for some period of time, which is fantastic, right? So a big hit. Now, you know, I shared this with you that I learned about the holiday of Juneteenth by watching an episode of Blackish. And to me, that was a metaphor for probably what the show was about, which is maybe helping a lot of people learn and grow. So can you just talk a little bit about how you see the show shaping attitudes and other things you do as well, certainly, but that that's kind of a marquee. How's it helping to shape attitudes, do you think? Well, I think there's a lot. I think, you know, if you think back to when Blackish launched, um, which was seven, eight years ago, the landscape of television was actually in a very different place. I think we've created a bit of a sea change in terms of um, telling stories that are through the face and the beingness of people of color and sort of attempting to balance out um, storytelling in this industry, in the industry of television. Um, our show from the start has been about an American family. Um, and we are not an American family who happens to be black. We're an American family who is black. So, so much of our experience, like so many other people, is through the lens of that and what that means to be a black person in this country in this day and age. And 
we are really, um, we have never shied away from, and it has, it has actually been intentional that we deal with all of the things that all of us are dealing with right now in our lives, whether it's, um, you know, having your parents be able to go to the doctor or the sex talk or police brutality or um, postpartum depression, all of the things that families are walking through, through the lens of this family. So I always like to say, it's like all the things that are on the wallpaper of our lives, we take some of them off, the things we take for granted and it's just kind of dealing with, you take them off the wall, put them onto the floor in the kitchen and see how this family responds to it. And we do it all through a lot of comedy. So um, it's been a really well-received show. I am so proud of what we've been doing and have done, but I, and, and I also think we have accomplished what we set out to do. We have created um, real clear cultural moments that I think we all are benefiting from, from conversations that are um, inspired because of the show. People come up to me and say they watch it with, you know, it's the one thing my teenager will do with me. We watch it together and then we have conversations. As you said, you mentioned mm -hmm. about Juneteenth. I, we all noticed, we don't know if there is a specific correlation, but we all noticed that after the Juneteenth episode, it appeared on the Apple calendar. Yeah. Um, so I think some people had no idea what Juneteenth was, and um, it also was a tipping point culturally in terms of people understanding the significance and importance for the Black community. Exactly. Well, you know, first of all, a big accomplishment that a teenager wants to do something with their parent associated with your show. That alone is that tells you you got something going there. But I agree. I mean, it must just feel fantastic to set out to have impact like you have. And there's many more chapters to come. But I, I really, really think that's amazing. Also, I'll say, you know, Mary, Blackish um, allowed me an opportunity to become a CEO. It was going to happen anyway. I've been on the road and I know we're going to get to that. Like it was a 10 year journey to the company, but the success of Blackish and where it positioned me in my career mm -hmm. was part of what allowed me to move forward it, with some of my dreams that I've had for a long time. So Blackish has done a lot professionally, a lot culturally, and a lot for me personally. So it put you, putting you more in the driver's seat. It seems to yeah. me right, especially with the Absolutely. size and scale of the impact of the show. That's that's great, and that makes that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about now this CEO chapter of your life with Pattern, and it's been a you know you are nothing if not tenacious but patient, and <laughs> you've been at this figuring this out for a while, which I love. But talk talk a little bit about the ten year journey, and and you know what brought you to finally being ready to launch Pattern. Okay. So it started as a personal experience for me. I think I could chronicle my journey of self-acceptance through my journey with my hair. And I'm not unique in that, but in the experience of it for me, I didn't know that I was amongst a large, vast group of people that were experiencing the same thing. Um, this, the culture of beauty and the standard of beauty didn't make space for me, didn't celebrate my authentic beauty or my authentic hair and how it grew out of my head. And we have been, um, the curly, coily, and tight textured community, we have been here forever. We have been here through time, historically and globally. This is not just an American community of people. Um, and so on my, in my process of trying to discover and understand my own hair, I was noticing that there were no products. And not only was I not seeing myself mirrored back to me, but I wasn't able to find products, let alone products that were affordable. Um, and when Girlfriends finished, which was in, 2000, no, we started in 2000, 2009. In 2009, when Girlfriends finished, can you believe it's 21? That's crazy. Anyway, no, yeah, when yeah. Girlfriends <laughs> finished, um, I wrote my first hair care brand pitch. And um, I started the process. And it was, the what was written in that first document is exactly, I mean, slight changes in language, but the intention of what I wanted to create remained the same for 10 years. And I think there were a couple of things going on. So I originally wanted to create products for curly hair like mine and tighter textures that would actually meet our needs from everything from size value because we use more conditioner than we do shampoo to, um, to the promise of the brand and, and actually um, creating good curls 
um, from your hair to be able to have slip that goes through your hair because um, we want to get enough hydration and moisture. All of those kinds of things were part of that initial mission. And the other part of my mission was to change the paradigm for how products were marketed to this community of people. I feel that marketing in general is based on shaming the customer. You have to feel bad about what you have so that you will be shamed in getting and purchasing this thing that you should buy so that you will be the best you you can be. I disagree as a shopper, as a person who has shopped my whole life. I buy the most when I feel the best. So I wanted to change this paradigm and actually celebrate the beauty of blackness and mirror that back to people and give them access to products that they didn't have. And the journey, um, the industry was not making space for that. I don't think the industry at the time understood the um, importance, the power, and the amount of money on the table around this community of people. Um, the products had been the same from my mother's generation to my grandmother's generation to mine, back in the corner in a dark space in the store. Um, those products work fine, but there was no expansion in that area. And so I went down this journey and I went through so many different knows, Mary. I mean, I know you know some of them, but yeah. it was why you, you need a professional. And I explained to people, most people in this demographic of hair have become their own best experts because we haven't had the product, so we become chemists in our own bathrooms. Um, it was, uh, you know, nobody knew how to, how do you create this from scratch? So I went down this journey and every no, I took that hit in and then clarified my mission and my vision and my promise more clearly and with better language. And what finally, I think the combination of my visibility, the industry's understanding of this black purchasing power that is $1.2 trillion um, on the table, uh, the fact that um, there was a natural hair movement that was developing, even the term black girl magic, all of these different things combined, the moment opened up and the market opened up and there I sat. And as you know, unlike most people, I actually went to have retail meetings before I even had my goop and before I had my uh, financial partners that were gonna run the operations. And I mm -hmm. landed with Ulta and made a choice to be with Ulta before I had any of those things. Um, and that has been a really extraordinary and learning process journey for us, but um, really amazing. So that that's kind of the long and that's, short of it. Right. And I would say for people in this audience, you know, at, there are so many great business lessons in their persistence and belief in yourself and your ideas and bringing them to life and, and taking the input and refining it. I mean, those are things that, you know, it, it pattern is quite successful. It's going to continue to really grow like crazy, but it took a lot to get there. And I think everybody in business, whether you're starting a business or you're working in a business, you need to understand that resiliency really matters. It's a combination, I think, of, you know, your courage and belief in yourself, but also being resilient. And I think courage that. and belief in the self, being resilient and also being clear what your promise is and what you're offering. Like what, right. what are you actually offering to the world through whatever it is you're creating? And how do you articulate that so that it translates for people to understand it on the other side of that conversation? And I think that was part of what I learned on that journey is, okay, is it I'm saying this wrong or is the problem on their side or mine? And so I would ask myself that question and keep clarifying to see if I could make it um, more translatable. Some of it I think was not me, some of it was me, some of it was the industry. Either way, I landed in the right place. I'm gonna right. turn well, my iPad off so I'm not distracted, but I noticed that it's still making noise. It's making, that happened to me a little while ago too. Anyways, um, but for the people, anybody in the audience who's of a marketing persuasion, you'll also hear some wonderful things. You know, Tracy figures this out as she goes, but truly what you build is a brand that all marketers dream of, which is a brand that has a really core essence and a core equity in values. And you bring it to life, you know, through everything, the packaging, the, the brand manifesto, the advertising. I mean, you, you really have such a talent for that. I think that's a great example of bringing your creative you know, your left and right brains together. Um, but having a big picture vision for a brand, for any brand is so important. I think what, you know, um, one of the things that was really helpful for me, which I pulled from other areas of my life is creating a mission statement. 
um, and yeah. having a clear mission statement that everything runs through so that it determines that honesty that you remain um, on course with. So for, for Pattern, for example, the mission is to create products that meet the needs of the curly, coily, and tight textured community, and that we are an active space that celebrates um, authentic beauty, and at the center of that, and the center of the brand is the celebration of Black beauty. And that means that we are the subject and not the object of all of our content and also of our products. And that way you stay completely, perfectly connected on that mission through everything you do, whether it's a photographer we choose or a creative agency that we hire, any of those things. Mm -hmm. and, and those are the conversations that we had from the beginning, Mary, in yeah. terms of if this is the mission of the brand, how do we make sure this matches up even in a retail space? Exactly. So good business lessons here for a lot of people to be taking notes on. Um, hey, one other thing I want to ask is kind of interesting. So we're here in Chicago virtually. And as you I'm sure you know, the Johnson Products was a, a company that was started here in Chicago, Ultra yeah. Sheen, Afro Sheen, some of the products that you know were there forever, I guess. And yeah. and I'd say that, you know, George and Joe Johnson were quite the entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, I'm just curious, is there anything about their entrepreneurial journey that resonated with you as you thought about Pattern? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, it is those people that um, tilled the soil for um, the industry and created space for what I'm doing now. And there's no question there in terms of that. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful because they, the strides that all of those companies made are the ones that made it possible for me to do what I'm doing now and also to learn from that and inspire me. Personally, Madam CJ Walker, although that is not Chicago based, um, her journey um, is one that I really, uh, have paid a lot of attention to and have been, and, and it's it's amazing to me that all those years ago, some of the same roadblocks are here now. Um, and I, it is very important to me that I um, do the work that needs to be done where I can, when I can, to open up those roadblocks so that in 20 years, those same ones are not here still. And I think that work is being done. It's work that I do with you guys at Ulta, and I think it's happening all across all industries. Um, but those are the places where fundamental change still needs to occur. But those examples of those companies and those mm -hmm. um, CEOs uh, are part of who inspire me to keep on my road. Right. Well, that's a very good pivot to you know, I want to spend a, a lot of time on this, the notion of diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, we'll put that header up there. And there's yeah. a lot of ways we can take this. I mean, there's the beauty industry, which, you know, I, I believe there's plenty of opportunity here. There is Hollywood and all things creative and the arts, but there's the world at large, right? There's all business. So I, I mean, I think that to me, it, after maybe the only silver lining about the murder of George Floyd, which we obviously just celebrated the one year anniversary of or mourned, was I think it, it being a catalyst for more people to be more open to having the right conversations. I mean, that's, you know, and I think that every company, every industry is at different places. And I think about it, whether it's the marketplace or the workplace, right? What's being sold or how representation happens or how supplier diversity happens. So. You know, I'm not sure maybe the best way to start, I'll let you pick, but we could talk, start about maybe the beauty industry first, maybe some of your observations about where do you think beauty as an industry is on this journey? Sometimes people ask me, what in er, inning are we in? I'm like, I don't know. I know a little bit about baseball, but I never know what inning I'm in. But, you know, but where do you think the beauty industry sits right now? And where maybe should we think about going from here? And then maybe we can pivot to other industries that you're studying and a part of as well. Well, I think in all industries, it's kind of similar what's happening. Okay. I think that um, there are, it is clear that there is systemic inequity baked in at a really foundational level in industry. Um, and so in order to create that change and really dive into those blind spots, I think there are some really um, real conversations and real action that needs to be taken. And companies, industries need to look at all the places and spaces and ways um, that they spend money and are actively pursuing diversity 
um, that systems are in place that can be dismantled and, and what it takes to actually dismantle those systems. And I think there's a lot of people that this is the work they do. And I encourage people to call on those individuals and organizations that actually know how to dive in in these very real ways. Um, one of the things I talk at Ulta a lot about um, is really, there's a couple of things, but is really allowing there to be measurable goals. Um, and I think having a, a, a measurable um, action helps us to keep making that change and walking towards it. Because to just say, you know, we want diversity, equity, and inclusion, it can be a sort of pie in the sky thing. And as much as you keep accountable to an actual measurable goal, I think change can occur. Um, I also really like to remind people the diversity, equity, and inclusion, the equity is incredibly important. Diversity and inclusion can end up being checkboxing exercises. Um, we, there was an article in Democracy Docket, I think, recently saying that you know the diversity and equity um, boxes that get checked, we get to that four percent place at most companies and industries, and then it stops because people think change has happened. But the equity part of it is, I think, where the fundamental change starts to occur. And we talk about you know oh, we need to add seats at the table. We need, it's not even, we, like, we need everybody at the table. Um, that table and having all of those different kinds of experiences is what actually opens us all up to our own blind spots, which we all have as companies and as individuals. And then I also talk a lot about the pipeline. You know, um, I think we need to be really intentional about that pipeline. And I, you know, I always, like there's so many pieces to this, but if you just look at HR and hiring practices and the way people hire, um, it's based on a standard that is steeped in systemic oppression around um, a certain kind of university that people have gone to, um, the amount of experience somebody has or who you know. Those three categories are steeped in an, uh, uh, um, a systemic oppression. And so if we start to change how HR is looking for hiring practices and we stop looking at the standards that are based in those old ideas, we can open up to a pool of talent and, um, and other kinds of people that will help that table to increase. And then we have to really work on a sustainable um, uh, pipeline that supports that talent in moving into the workforce. And, and I, and I think, you know, I mean, I, I could, you know, Mary, I could talk about this stuff forever. There's so much, um, there's so much work to be done. There's so much good that is happening. These conversations, these uncomfortable and sharp and difficult conversations are occurring. Um, but there is actual work to be done and it should not be a performative experience. And I really like to say that, Diversity, equity, and inclusion is about the love of humanity and fundamental change. It's not about sales. Although, like we saw in the McKinsey report about Hollywood, there are you know billions of dollars being left on the table when you don't fix the diversity problem. Right. Well, and you know, again, I think for our audience, I, I think most business leaders have kind of taken the first step of understanding that we need to have more representation in our, in, our, in our ranks and need to think about the world more inclusively and through the lens of equity. But I think what's great about some of your piece of advice is I would encourage people to get, continue, as you said, talk to experts, continue to get advice from people who've lived this and seen it across different industries, like you have example. And even like in the case of Pattern, you know, this is interesting, but when it was first launched at Ulta Beauty, you know, we, had an estimate of what we thought the brand would sell and the brand sold way more, Tracy knew it would. And our team was doing everything right. I mean, but we we're based on history and based on lack of data and knowledge and, and, and maybe you know opening the aperture to the possibility. And, and again, we've been quite successful with the launch, but I think that was a, a good clue about sort of, there's levels of assumptions that we make about things that probably add on top of each other. Yeah, there are levels of assumption that we all come by honestly because yeah. of the structures that we've been living in. And I think so much of what's happening right now is this understanding that we need to actually look at those financial 
foundational systems that are in place. And I mean, for example, like I said, that human resources, like one, I don't know, that was something that I didn't even realize. But as a CEO now looking in hiring practices, you start to go, wait, I know there's talent out, out there. So why are you telling me there isn't? You know, or the 15% pl uh, pledge that right. Aurora has come up with and really mm -hmm. um, looking and diving into that and what that does change in terms of equity and how that really makes a shift. And also you talked about the data, you know, by the way, it was a really fun, it was, it was a, a really big learning moment for me because at first, you know, selling out, I was like, we're a hit, we're a success. And then I was like, wait, why did we sell out? And then I was like, wait, how long will it be to restock? Because when yeah. you base all of these things on either an assumption or a history that doesn't actually support this demographic, this group of people, you don't have the right information. And so, you know, we had a conversation about that to make sure. Um, and as a person of color, so many people of color will tell you, it, we're always a surprise. And so part of what I am working to do in the industry is make sure that we create and have the data that supports how important and, and um, uh, how important we are and what money we have to spend. You know what I mean? So they, those two things actually match up and we right. can actually, you know, help us all thrive in the right way. So, so much great advice. I have a little right. lightning round stuff. I have some lightning round stuff I want to get to at the end, but I have one more question I, just to wrap up, kind of bringing yeah. things together. You know, I think I read that you just signed a pretty big production deal. Um, and I, I'm, I don't know anything about it, except I imagine this is yet another platform for you to create. And uh, I'd be so curious if you could share with us how you're thinking about that. Yeah, you know, as I said in the beginning, when I first started, one of my missions that runs through all areas of my life and aspects of my career is expanding the understanding of humanity, um, who we are as people and celebrating um, black beauty um, and black stories and expanding our equity in terms of us being able to tell our own stories. So I signed a really great production deal with ABC Signature, which is across all of their platforms, my home at ABC, and all those extraordinary people have given me an opportunity to do more and expand my version of storytelling there. And I have a lot of projects in the works, which I'm ha is happening at the same time, but it's really about telling stories that continue in a bright and buoyant way to celebrate who we are as people um, and that nuance and that all of those beautiful gray areas that make up the fabric and the texture of this country and how beautiful this, this country and, and how beautiful we are as people. Um, and so that's a really, it's another really fun process for me. But the truth is I look at pattern as a version of storytelling the same way I do with Joy Mill Entertainment. Um, and I, I love using my experience and where I've gotten to in my life to be able to share and create content and not just be plugged in somewhere. It's a really exciting, um, right. position that I'm in now. I would say that's a mic drop, but I only have a gavel. So I'm gonna say that's a gavel <laughs> drop. Well, but seriously, Tracy, you go, girl. you're going to be very busy as you always are, but I, I think am. it's a very exciting, very exciting new chapter ahead. And I, I can't wait to see what you produce. I'm sure it's going to be amazing. So let's wrap it up with some fun lightning round, just because we want to have yeah. fun, because I don't know what to expect from you on these I, things. I, so don't know that, I don't know that I know these questions, so I'm I know. So, so, okay. All right. We're just going to say quick, quick question, you know, whatever comes to mind. So what's the bravest thing you've ever done? The bravest thing? Oh, hands down my TED talk. Hands down. Oh, Scariest yeah. thing I've ever done. I opened up the conference, first black woman to ever open up the conference. It was the, one of the first things that I've ever done that was completely, um, it, it didn't have to do with my acting career. It didn't have to do with my humor or fashion. It was literally, um, things that I was thinking about and putting forth and it was really scary and it was great. I've seen it. It was fantastic. Okay. And you were dressed very, you know, like conservative, not conservative, yes. you, were, you know, I can see what you mean. It was, it was, on, um, it was on the wisdom of fury and women yes. um, embracing the anger that comes up and the information that's in there. Yeah, it was fantastic. Okay. What's your best life hack? 
Oh man, um, get your sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you okay. cannot you cannot do all these things in life if you are tired. So get your okay. sleep. My brain's got to stay active. I like this. What is something that people don't know about you? Oh, I don't think people know that I'm extremely organized and that I would I before my career as an actor and in between modeling, I would go into companies and organize them. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cute. And now I'm sure Pattern's really organized. Um, what's your favorite Diana Ross song? Ooh, Mary, that's a good question. I'm going to say Mirror, Mirror. Okay. Um, tell me, Mirror, Mirror on the wall. Okay, that's it. That's enough, oh, enough of that. I love it. Okay, that's good. What's your best travel tip? I know you love to travel. Listen, I wish I had better travel tips. I'm such an overpacker, Mary. I like oh. all my things with me. I have such beautiful clothes. I like to bring them. I'm such an overpacker. I wish someone would give me a good travel tip and tell me how to properly have all the outfits I want, but not overpack. Well, if you ever were at an Ulta Beauty General Managers Conference, you would see all overpacking in, in real time. And, and we've concluded it's better to have more options than not. So that's, that's, that's how I, I get over that. I would better wait to have for the options. options. Better have the options. Okay. What is a, is there a TV or movie role that you passed on that you wish you hadn't passed on? No, my career hasn't gone like that, Mary. Um, I have <laughs> not been offered things like crazy in my career, particularly after Girlfriends finished. I thought the pearly gates of Hollywood were going to open. But no, I have continued to audition for all of the roles that I've gotten. So I would not say that there's a role I passed on that they, I was like, oh, they offered it to me. I don't want to take it. But I will tell you there was a role earlier in my career, very early in my career, a movie called Mixing Nia that I wanted so badly, I mean so badly, and I did not get it. It went to, um, oh, I can't think of her name right now, from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and I still wish I'd gotten that movie. Well, okay, that's good to know. That's good to know, we all have those in our lives. Yep. All right, final question, what's your best piece of advice? What's your go-to? I think my best piece of advice is, um, may the space between where you are and where you want to be inspire you. I know that the hardest thing for me is often knowing where I want to be, but like, how do I get there? It reminds me of the dream with pattern. Like, I know I want to do hair products. How do I make goop? I have no idea. How do you actually make a hair product? How do you take your dream and pull it up into the atmosphere? Um, and I feel if you can let those spaces actually inspire you, you will take one step at a time and before you know it, you will look up and you have crossed the roaring rapids and you are on the other side with whatever that dream was. So um, trust the process and let it inspire you. Wow, that is a great one. I'm gonna take that one. I think sometimes the distance between where somebody, where we are, where we wanna be can be more the opposite. It can scare us. So I love yep. the fact that it should inspire us. That's fantastic. Okay, well, David. Hi, David. <laughs> Hey, Tracy, Mary, Tracy, great conversation. We're going to now segue to some questions from our members. Okay, um, and great. we have several. Great. Perfect. So uh, just to stay on the diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion theme, a question from uh, member uh, Laurent Theravel, and he notes that uh, diversity and inclusion is, is fairly measurable, or at least has some measurable aspects to it. But how do you measure the concept of equity, which is a much more qualitative measure of a company's inclusion? Well, I think, for example, if we were to use um, Aurora's 15% uh, pledge, I think that's an example, is that if we are trying to change the equity in the market and allowing um, other businesses and business owners into that shelf space, 15% is the amount that matches our, um, what do you call it? the demographics of our, what do you call that? Why can't I think of that word? Doesn't matter. It matches the percentages of who we are in the culture. Um, so that is a measurable um, response that you can see, like if you can start to change that. The other thing is I think a lot of people don't take into account where the rubber meets the road. So if we take it, for example, um, into pay equity, um, pay equity, for example, <laughs> equity. If you start to bring up salaries, 
you know, if you look in Hollywood in the industry and the way different people are paid, whether it's between women and men, um, in Hollywood, in any industry, those are some of the ways that you can start to measure those differences. And those are some of the ways that when the rubber meets the road, I don't think people are paying enough attention to. And there's a reason that we have those, um, those challenges going on. But to me, those are the ways you can measure those things. I don't know if I answered that succinctly enough, you but did. I think I'll give you examples. Okay. Great. Uh, shifting to several questions about your, your career and your business career specifically. So you have a really eclectic and broad portfolio uh, of activities. You're, you're an actor, you're a CEO, you're a producer, you're a diversity and inclusion advisor. How do you balance that portfolio, um, you know, weighing each one every day? And then maybe uh, kind of as a follow-up is what is your typical day like? Okay. Um, well, the truth is they all, they look diverse from the outside, but they're all the same from the inside. I think the biggest um, roadblock in all of that is time. Like, you know, we all have 24 hours in the day. And as I said before, sleep is really important. So if you take eight hours out on that, and you got a little eating in there, we don't have much time to get it all done. So for me, they all are the same in that I am showing up to them all with a sense of honesty and focused on a greater good. So whether it's choosing a role or what choices I have to make in terms of pattern, whether it's what's written on the back of a package or who we're hiring as a photographer or as a producer, who we're gonna, um, who's gonna write this script or who's not, it's all coming from the exact same place for me. So the thing that ends up, as I said, being the challenge is how do you schedule all of that so that everything gets its 100% of your attention? And what I've done is military precision. I have a schedule that is booked and I even schedule in my rest time and my food time. Otherwise I am a person that will forget to eat. And just to be clear, once you get to 48 years old, forgetting to eat does not make you skinny. It actually makes you go in the other direction. So um, <laughs> you just get tired and your body thinks it's starving. So it holds more. Um, but I think for me, it's really about scheduling my time and a typical day for me I wake up and I start going. Um, it's it's a it's a move from there. But what I try and do is move consciously through my day. Um, I try and give what I'm doing the attention that it deserves 100%. One of, I believe, my definitions of meditation is doing what I'm doing while I'm doing it. So I really try and allow my full self to be attentive to what I'm doing while I'm in that process. And my other big trick, David, is notes, notebooks and notes. And I have a system for it. I handwrite because it connects with my brain as opposed to typing. And everything in the corner, there's a way that I categorize what I'm taking notes on so I can always look back and see. And I pull those bullet points. And in most of my um, uh, not-for-profit work that I do, I'm known as the note taker. So in most of the, like in the communities that I work in, I'm always the note taker in the group. Okay. Related uh, member question. So how has being an actor uh, informed you to be a better CEO? And maybe this is a stretch, but how has been a CEO informed you to perhaps become a better actress? The second part of it has been the most interesting. Um, the CEO part of it has given me a courage and an understanding of context from a business standpoint that translates into any industry. So as an actor, um, to be able to use the courage that I have as a CEO, that I've discovered as a CEO, and be able to know how a story translates, what mm -hmm. is actually being looked for out in the market, how people are receiving things, all of that, how to tell a story consistently and clearly um, as an entrance point into people's hearts, that I've really honed as a skill as a CEO. In terms of how my acting has informed my CEO life, it's really just that I trust my creative intuition. I trust my heart and I know how to use it and I know how to translate it into language and I know how to communicate what's in my heart through um, language. And that has come from being an actor. And so I'm grateful for the merge of both. I think both sides of my life and career and both sides of my brain have informed each other and allowed me to function really efficiently. 
So earlier you made a reference that you learned to be a CEO. So across that journey of a decade or more, did you have any mentors or sponsors that really helped you along the way to get to the point where Pattern is today? The truth is I am a person who has always um, been curious in all areas. So like I ask a lot of questions and my mom taught me very young that uh, asking why is a great question or saying, I'm sorry, I don't understand that. Can you explain? To pretend that I don't know what something is, I let go a long time ago. So the truth is my CEO journey has only been in the last three to four years once my relationship with Ulta and my retail partners started. And then I gained I found my operational partners and I established a deal that allowed me to be CEO founder and to have full creative control of the company. Um, and oh my God, I just forgot your question. <laughs> no, whether you had these mentors or sponsors over time. Yes, thank you. I knew I was answering something. Okay. I'm here so, for you. So my curiosity um, has led me to having so many different mentors. Um, Mary is somebody that I've asked a ton of questions of. Melody Hobson, um, Melody Hobson, um, Brittany Packnett, um, Brittany Packnett Cunningham. In all different areas, I have reached out to people and said, hey, I don't know how to do this, can you help me? Or could you suggest somebody else if you aren't the person? And, um, and I think that's a big part of it. I have found that if you ask for help, people are there to help and people are there to answer questions. I also have a really strong core of girlfriends um, and friends that I run things by all the time. And I also have a really, really strong professional team that supports me in all of these areas. But I'll, I mean, I will be completely honest. My CEO journey has been like, I, I'm learning, I don't know. You know, it's, it's really been that. And, I, and it's been a big growth curve for me. And boy, do I love it. Yeah. I mean, Mary so, has been prefer the, the closest sort of front row witness. Now, just on pattern specifically, you, you mentioned that you built the company through trial and error over 10 years and that you developed the products on your own. Take us inside where you, you mentioned people that were developing hair care products in their bathroom. You know, how, what was your journey? How did you develop the products on your own? Well, so originally I started, um, I went out and found my own chemist because I was like, look, this process of trying to get somebody else to support me on this journey is not happening. So that was one of the most fruitful turning points for me because what I discovered is that the reason me as a person with curly and coily tight textured hair who couldn't find products was the actual efficacy was determined on a standard of beauty that was not mine. So deciding if a product was um, effective was based on how your hair is with when it's dry. And most people with curly coil and tight textured hair can tell if they're gonna have a good hair day or if a product works when their hair is wet. So that was one of my big turning points. When I found my operational partners, I came into a product development person and people who could actually help me with the language of how to, to actually express what it was that I wanted a product to do and how you get the chemistry, you know, like the, the actual formula to match what you want the effect to be. And I tried, are you ready for this, David? I tried 75 different samples before we landed on our products. And that was me in my bathroom. It had to make it through me first before it went to our test group. And because I am not a chemist and I've not been a product development person for my entire life, the easiest way for me to tell and give feedback was to make videos. So I would usually do three videos per shower. I would get out of the shower, give the feedback, get back in the shower for each phase of each product. Um, and that's how we moved along. And it's still what we do. So uh, speaking of product development, a question from Chelsea Harvey, and she notes that you've been very successful in the hair care market and was wondering whether you see Pattern or an allied company expanding into other markets in the, uh, in the cosmetics or beauty business. Well, there was a reason that I called Pattern Pattern Beauty and not Pattern Hair Care. Um, there is space for this and this idea of centering a company around authentic beauty. Um, and 
other ways that this community of the curly, coily, and tight textured hair um, that moves into beauty in general. So I do think that there is the potential for expansion, but the truth is there's still so much to discover within the hair care space that that's where I'm at right now. And I'm really loving it. And there's some good stuff occurring. Um, but yeah, I go, oh, go ahead. No, just a follow up question is, uh, is someone asked, you know, where do you see pattern being five years from now? Where do I see pattern being five years from now? Let's jump to two years first. I would say that there would be real distribution expansion um, because I believe that the natural hair care movement, the natural hair movement is a revolution and I want everyone to have access to it. I said it in that video, there's a revolution of celebration occurring. And so expanding distribution and expanding into the um, the global market. Because as I said, also this community, this vast group of people with curly coil and tight textured hair, they are across the globe. And so I want everyone to have access. And one of the things I say about pattern is I want everyone, I think everyone should have access to their most beautiful hair and their most beautiful self in their own bathroom. If you choose to go to a professional to help you through that process, good for you and great. And you should do that. But I feel that you should have access to your most beautiful self in your bathroom. And so I'm hoping in the next two years, three years that we expand um, globally and, you know, see what else is in there in terms of um, really diversifying um, in the hair care space. A few questions on advice to other budding entrepreneurs, especially entrepreneurs yeah. of color. Yeah. So I'm saying what advice you may have for uh, other oh, entrepreneurs. I was, entrepreneurs waiting, of color I was waiting for the question. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> okay. So I would say that my advice, um, I don't like advice. I like to offer experience, strength, and hope. So what I would say to people is, and I said it before, but be clear about what it is that you are offering. What is it? What is your unique idea and how do you put that into language? And then once you've done that, do the research. What else is out there in the market? Is there something else like it? And if there is, how do you make your idea more unique? The other is, what is your specific connection and mission within that promise of your brand that is that has and carries the story, the narrative of your brand or your business that you're trying to create? How is there a personal connection that tells a story there? The other thing I like to, to say to people is that if you can focus on the greater mission and keep it connected to your honest promise, the money will come, but the journey will be clear. And that to me is how you keep your eye on the prize. Great. Couple closing questions uh, from a member. What's on your bucket list, both professionally and personally? Bucket list. I'd like to do an action movie. <laughs> I really have a desire to do that kick where you roll on the floor and then your leg goes out and it knocks someone down. I really would like to learn how to do that. And I would like that to happen in a movie at some point. That's number one. Number two, I'd love a book. I'd love to write a book one day. Um, number three, hmm. I'd like to expand globally in terms of the bucket list for pattern. Um, I think that's really important to me, but I think those are two really good ones for bucket list. <laughs> Great. You're, you're a trendsetter. People are wondering, what are you watching and what are you listening to these days? Wow. Okay. I watch everything. Um, and it's so hard because the way we consume content now, it's like it goes in. It's like, it's like you're eating popcorn. It goes out. Yes, I watched Bridgerton. I loved it. Dying for Succession to come back on TV. Can't wait for Atlanta to come back on. I love... Um, Let's see, Insecure, Queen Sugar. Um, what did I just finish watching? Um, there's so many good documentaries right now. Um, wait, I just finished watching other things. I don't know, that was a good list. That's like a nice strong list. Um, oh, I loved Fleabag. I loved Catastrophe. Um, I loved the other Phoebe Waller-Bridge with Sandra Oh, I can't think of the name. So I, I love dramas. I love dramas more than comedies. And what am I listening to? I love Moses Sumney. I love Samfa. Um, I love Doja Cat and Sweetie. Um, I love that Best Friend song is so good. 
Um, I always love Frank Ocean. Um, yeah. Great. One last question from the audience. Yeah. Uh, Mary referenced your love for travel. What is your first post COVID trip? Well, I've taken a couple of COVID trips uh, recently. I finally went back. I love a solo vacation, but I cannot wait to get back to Europe. I can't wait to get to Italy, to Paris. Um, I still have never been to Japan. I'd love to go to Japan. I do love traveling. I just love traveling. I love traveling on my own and I love traveling with people. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm an overpacker. And when I say overpacker, I don't just mean overpacking. I mean, it's ridiculous. But what are you going to do? You're just going to have no shame and you're going to be who you are and you're going to get on that plane and pay extra for your baggage. It is what it is. Tracy, on behalf of our members, and I guess I cannot thank you enough for the really terrific conversation today, the lively back and forth with you and Mary. This has just been a wonderful experience for everybody. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, David, for having me. Thank you, Mary. I am in such good company at the Economic Club. I'm just, it's so exciting for me to be here. And again, I wish it was in person, but maybe down the line. And I hope everybody is seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm grateful for this time we had together. Thank you, Tracy.